News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. Hello there, very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. My guest this evening is of course the uh, uh, SJB representative, the main person I suppose on matters financial for the SJB, Mr. Iran Vikramaratna. Um, very good evening to you, Iran. Good evening. And uh, before we start, I'd just like to, uh, to say my, my own piece, if you like. Um, and that is this, that finally, again, uh, the people of Sri Lanka, uh, there is cause for the people of Sri Lanka to rejoice in, uh, in the uh, pronouncements of the Supreme Court. Uh, the <coughs> Supreme Court today issued an interim order um, restraining the Treasury Secretary, the Ministry of Finance, from withholding funds that were allocated in the budget for the holding of these elections. And so that is uh, a victory of sorts for democracy. And uh, uh, I think that we should all be lighting, collectively, lighting a huge candle uh, for the Supreme Court. Iran, um, uh, how important is this decision today? Uh, it's very important because uh, it's, a, it's the highest court of the country and uh, I have always said that this availability of funds is no, or not availability of funds to all the elections is absolute nonsense. Mm. It's only um, the request has been only for 4.5 billion. Mm. Uh, every election we have had in the past, you know, they have paid two months, four months, eight months later. Mm. Right, and only a part of it has been had to be spent up front. And if you look at a day's expenditure of the government, mm. this is like one third of a day's expenditure of a government. A right. Day's expenditure. Right. So this is absolute nonsense anyway. Mm. And the Supreme Court has taken the right decision, uh, and that uh, money should not be withheld to hold an election. And uh, and so uh, obviously uh, the the game is on now. Uh, and it would mean automatically, I suppose, that the SJB have a really good chance of making uh, a difference for, uh, the, on behalf of the people of this country, uh, uh, suffering as they have been for all these years uh, of poor mismanagement and so on and so forth. So <coughs> what's your plan? How are you going to get us out of this economic rut? Uh, <clears throat> getting Sri Lanka out of the economic rut, there is no easy answer. If I were to say that, uh, Faraz, I would be, uh, you know, making a joke of it. Mm. Uh, so, because there are so many issues, uh, so we generally plunge into the financial issues, being financial people and economists. Yeah. Uh, but some of the fundamental issues are to do with confidence. Right. Uh, and the confidence level needs to be high and mm. uh, the confidence in government needs to be high. Mm. So uh, if you look at it, uh, I mean the International Monetary Fund is only one issue and yeah. everybody keeps talking about that and at some point the International Monetary Fund we need to be signing up to an agreement. Mm. Uh, we have always said that we needed to be having an agreement with the International Monetary Fund because it gives a signal to the market that the government is committed to certain fiscal mm. disciplines, so which is absolutely necessary and, and, and they should be doing that. But uh, go going beyond that, because once you get that money, it's a signal to the market, mm. then we are expecting that we could access borrowings and we will also expect that finally investments need to come in. Mm. Because we can't run this country on borrowings. No. We really need to have and, and there comes my second question. How on <coughs> earth are you going to attract foreign investment into Sri Lanka, we, we are sort of uh, challenged by several things, including a lack of raw materials. We have agro-based raw materials, but uh, nothing else really. Our electricity is double what it is in India. Uh, India and Bangladesh offer um, tax cuts and so on. We also have uh, the rigidity of our uh, labor laws uh, to contend with. And on top of that, we have another rigid matter, and that is the level of uh, holidays we have in this country, all sort of uh, going against uh, uh, any foreign company coming to Sri Lanka. And in 2015, um, uh, that government did away with this one-day approval business at the BOI. Um, and so how on earth are we going to attract? What should we be doing? What's your solution? Yeah, so uh, as I said on the confidence issue, Faraz, 
uh, you are talking about attracting foreign investment, yeah. which, is, which is very important. At the moment, we are dealing with the situation there are large brands, right, and, um, have announced that some of them want to leave Sri Lanka. Mm. So, uh, for example, Taise <coughs> Corporation, yeah. which was uh, dealing with the uh, international airport, a terminal building, they were yeah. getting money of more than $400 million from JICA. Uh, that project had been been worked on for years mm. this government came in and basically they set aside that project mm. you do a thing like that you immediately people lose confidence in the system right so Thai say then we heard now recently that Mitsubishi corporation yeah. which has also been here for years and years mm. right have also decided to quit Sri Lanka mm. so these if you really look at it this is a confidence issues then, uh, you know, I brought this matter up in Parliament as well, you see, uh, that people need to know there's a rule of law, businessmen also need to know that agreements will be honoured, and also the Dinesh Shaft, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, death recently, uh, also has thrown some question marks for business people that, you know, about uh, basic fundamental things, safety things, because people talk always relative in terms of facts and figures and statistics, bankers, economists and all. Mm. A lot of soft factors mm. that need to be do. And then low hanging fruits, people keep, businessmen keep talking about, you go and there is corruption, mm. right, and there is corruption. And uh, at every stage there is. But you know, this government has still not done a single thing to show that they are serious about tackling the issue of corruption. Absolutely. So, there are, again, one of my questions, where, what, what, where is the <coughs> political commitment and where does the SJB stand in terms of a political donations act or some form of uh, laws to control uh, elect, uh, elections funding? Yeah, so the, 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 the government has just brought in a new law which was passed in parliament mm -hmm. on expenditure uh, controls uh, and, you know, f in during elections. Mm. Uh, they rushed this law through and we are not opposed to the law at all. We are in principle agreed with it. What we were concerned about is they were rushing it through after an election had been declared. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes ineffective because you can't work all the regulations and mm. the practices out. But there is now <coughs> at least a law in place. There are lots of deficiencies in it because it was rushed. But at least it's a starting point and we can improve on it. So there is a, there is a start there. But anti-corruption laws are not in place yes. The independence of the anti-bribery commission is not in place. Uh, stolen assets recovery. So, so we're back to the same question. How on earth are we going to <coughs> attract foreign investment here? Yeah. yeah, so as I said, there's so many steps. It's a confidence issue. So corruption needs to be hand-tackled on one side. People being given the the confidence of whom we, they are actually, uh, you know, <coughs> dealing with, mm. and then uh, if the uh, IMF uh, is signed up and the reforms are going through, mm. that certainly will give confidence. My issue uh, with the IMF thing is not a question of should it be. We have been saying from two years before bankruptcy was declared yeah. that Sri Lanka has to have an agreement. We have been saying, for example, revenues need to be increased. No question about it, because when we were in government 2015 to 19, that's something we actually did, mm. right? We increased the tax net from 950,000 to 1.5 million. We increased the revenues of GDP from 10% to nearly 13%. Now mm. it's at a low of 8%, and that has to be done. There is no debate about it. And the debate is that when we are negotiating with the IMF, we had to put programs in place which can be carried through. Sri Lanka has had 15 programs with the IMF, mm. right? And uh, seven of it have never been completed. And we don't want this also to be an incomplete one. Yeah. And that is why uh, we have brought up certain issues which, it, which say that needs to be addressed. For example, uh, I, I said cost has never been addressed, not mm. even in the last budget. Whether it's public services, whether it's state-owned enterprises, whether it's defense expenditures, mm. not addressed. Then on the other side, on the revenue side, taxes have been increased yeah. and taxes have to be increased. Revenues have to go up. But uh, I have been arguing that uh, particularly the tax-free threshold that has been given mm. is insufficient. That needs to be increased. And the reason is those are the people who actually, the middle class, who go out daily to work. 
-hmm. They work with dignity. They they really take care of themselves. They take care of their children. They take care of their parents, their grandparents, and so forth. We don't want to make them a dependent class. Inflation has actually wiped out the actual the 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 value of their income, yeah. right? And therefore, they need to be protected. So some have uh, put forward the argument that you know, in some countries, yeah, yeah, you know, if if you if you um, you know look at how it has actually worked, yeah. that the income decides the norm of the decides that Sri Lanka, you know, where you exempt, that Sri Lanka fits in that. Sometimes they have looked at the per capita, uh, uh, or they have looked at the income, right? And now Sri Lanka's tax-free income is hundred thousand rupees. If you take it in dollars, it's a little less than three thousand uh, dollars. If you look at it you know, on an annual basis, and mm. then uh, if you look at uh, it in Thailand, they also start about roughly about four thousand dollars, and said, mm. therefore, uh, the, the it's fine taxing at the hundred thousand. Mm. Uh, my argument is different. It's not fine. One is uh, Sri Lanka then rapidly goes up to thirty six percent. It right. goes, goes up to thirty six percent. Because at every forty-one thousand rupees, you know, the taxes increasing. go up by increases by six percent. Yeah. So, you know, whereas in Thailand, to get up to thirteen uh, percent, to thirty percent of the tax, you know, uh, your uh, income goes up by about twelve times your starting right. uh, income. Sri Lanka's is only three times your starting income. And the other thing is, we are in crisis because the real value, because of the inflation, food inflation near ninety percent. Uh, general inflation was 70, 60, now maybe 55 has gone up. Yeah. You see, and therefore it's not, you know, you can't directly only compare uh, the, the statistics. You have to look at the reality on the ground. Mm. The other thing is reforms are needed and reforms need to be pushed through. You have to get in a buy in for the reforms as well, right? And we don't want to push people basically onto the streets. We want to actually uh, buy them in. Everybody needs to realize that they all have to take responsibility, mm. and th there is no question about that principle. Yeah. But then we have to be really practical, mm. right, in in in, in our uh, approach. Uh, I was told that the thing is, if you increase the tax-free threshold from let's say 100 to 200, then there's going to be a loss, right, of about 50, 60 billion rupees. Mm. Uh, I think that there are various ways of recovering that. For example. If you go and implement the, the, the tobacco tax yeah. based on right a formula, so that when cigarette prices are increased, the majority of the increase actually falls into re government revenue rather than into the revenue of a company, mm. right? And if we follow the formula, uh, so tobacco taxes alone can bring maybe 40, 50 billion extra. Mm -hmm. Withholding tax, it's yeah. only five percent. Yeah. Withholding tax, it's doubled. Right, you may uh, get a, you know, instead of getting a 80 million or whatever, you might get 160 bi uh, mm -hmm. bi billion rupees. So yeah. I'm saying is I, 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 I'm not measuring on exact numbers, right? But I can tell you that the logic stands. Uh, this is finance, but this is also finance which has to be seen. In the context, the socio-political context of what actually can be achieved. So, do you do you um, do you believe? Are you satisfied with President Rickmasinger's economic policies thus far? Uh, I would say uh, uh, sometimes there is no major disagreement on the principles, hmm. but there is uh, right uh, sometimes disagreement on the application, and the application is absolutely important hmm. because if you fail on the application, then uh, your, your your principle itself will be challenged. I noticed that the SJB so, is proposing a sort of unified uh, central collection system for taxes. That's right. So, uh, the two things there. One is increase the tax net, increase the revenue. And the unified revenue system yeah. right, uh, will also help because it will also uh, reduce the interaction between officials and the taxpayers. It can be inland revenue, it can be excise, it can be customs. Right. Some countries have actually come up with these solutions and they have done it successfully. And therefore, this is certainly something that we need to do. Mm. And uh, we have been uh, talking about it, we have put it in our proposals mm. uh, because we want to increase tax revenues, but also 
we want to make sure that individuals and businessmen right uh, have a life much more easy in than terms they are of doing pain. now and on that note let's go for a quick break uh, we're in conversation this evening with mr eran vikramaratna from the sjb we'll listen to the uh, headline news from the news first prime time news team and yeah. see you on the other side of the break thank you News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. TV One. TV for Life. Supreme Court issues interim order preventing the withholding of funds for the local government election 2023. Election Commission meets. Local government election announcement delayed. Change of government can only be brought about through a parliamentary election. Streets are not an option for parliament, says President. Harsha and Chandima revealed that Bajira Bay Vardhana passed eight gazettes as Committee on Public Finance acting chairman. Sri Lanka raises policy interest rates by 1%. Trade unions decided on trade measures that will be adopted from the 8th of March. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with Mr. Eran Vikramaratna of the SJB. Um, previously, when the dollar was around the 200 mark, there was a lot of uh, talk about must float, must float, and so on. Well, it's floating now, isn't it? It's gone up to 365. And now no one's talking about floating the dollar. Should it be floated? Uh, is it being flo uh, is it floating yeah uh, uh, certainly the the uh, devaluation yeah. right uh, of the dollar uh, there are pluses and minuses in it yeah. because uh, uh, business wants it always to be realistic so that it can be competitive and particularly for exports mm. right it needs to be competitive mm. and uh, Sri Lanka has to give exports the first place mm. because uh, while we have the two structural defects in the economy like the budget deficit and the foreign currency deficit it's the foreign currency one that actually how will the SJB uh, encourage exporters yeah, so uh, there's many, many different steps that need to mm. be taken. Mm. The first thing is, uh, if you look at Sri Lanka's GDP, right, a large proportion of it, 75, 80 percent of this GDP comes from small and medium industries. Mm. And uh, these people generally, goods and services, they sell it generally in their town or in their district or locally, mm. uh, right? So uh, if, a, if a country is really developing, mm. right, uh, then the export structure of that company can't rely on a few large companies exporting. You need to have a multitude of companies exporting. Mm. But the small companies have a problem. One is sometimes their quality needs to be raised to be of international standing. Mm. The second thing is that they don't really know where their markets are. So government intervention, large companies can find out where their markets are, small ones find it difficult. So government intervention and assistance is needed there. Uh, small companies also need, you know, in terms of approvals, mm. you know, they need help. So the concept of the BOI, the one-stop shop, mm. not only for foreign investors, we need it for the locals as well. But you know when you took out this uh, one-day approval business, uh, in a way pre-approval, um, isn't it, didn't it open up the opportunities for corruption again? In what sense? In the sense that, you know, if you give them the approval on day one and they come in on the basis that, look, you can, uh, <coughs> we like your idea, here's the approval, go, go out there and get the different line ministry approvals and so on, then the investor is sort of uh, boosted, his hopes are boosted, he, he is given confidence. Whereas if you go through a long process, um, the opportunities for corruption are much greater. Yeah, so because he's still chasing mm. after his approval. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the the the, the, the 
from the investor's side or the businessman side he wants his approvals quickly yeah. because if he wants to get it done so the question is to see how much of that could be centralized mm. so that he could get it so centralized within the BOI system no, no, I'm not talking of the present BOI. Okay. I'm talking of locally, right. the BOI concept mm. for local, right. small and medium industries and local mm. industries, that concept. So uh, there are many, many things there. One is local approvals, whether it's municipal approval, a UDA approval, a utility approval, or a land approval. Mm. So on land, because most of the land in this country is owned by the government, right? And I see the SJB wants to have a national land bank. Yes, so we need to create it because people get stuck there. Now, uh, I have personal experience. While in government, I try to do a multimodal transport hub. Uh, it takes me about two years just to get the land cleared hmm. because I have to get everybody around the table. It's a, it's a local municipal council, it's a UDA, it's a CGR, it's a CTB and so forth and so on. Now businessmen don't want to stay two years. They want their decision basically. If, a, if it's a local businessman, he might grumble and stay six months. If it's a foreign investor, they don't want to be staying more than two months. Hmm. They'll be off to another country, which it is done. So the concept is that BOI concept needs to be there for the local and land in particular we have identified mm. is a really uh, big obstacle and, and I've been traveling throughout the country talking to business groups mm. all over mm. the country in, in the last month. Mm. Uh, so we, we need to absolutely resolve that there's no question about it and then help these small and medium companies to uh, you know really get into the export market as well. Um, it all sounds very good, excepting, thank you for your questions, by the way, 0772-300-305. Uh, there are people uh, pointing out that even in, uh, during the um, corona period, India's FDI actually grew. Um, and <coughs> what is it that India is doing right and that Sri Lanka hasn't done ro um, right or is doing wrong? Yeah, so one thing that India has done uh, right is the whole process for investment mm. has been simplified. Uh, I mean, it's really uh, marvelous just looking at what they have done, mm. how the processes have been simplified. Mm. Uh, and, and uh, you know, sometimes we look at institutions and we say we need to reform it. Mm. Uh, what India is doing is it's not looking at institutions and saying we have to reform it they're like really looking at it out of the box mm -hmm. and they're saying, let's start, you know, something's anew, right. you see. And, yeah. and this <coughs> idea that we have, mm -hmm. uh, and, and talking on this concept of the BOI even for local industries, yeah. is looking at it outside the box. Certainly, for the foreign ones, we will have to do that. There's no question about it. With who are we competing with, right? India, right, has done it, and investments are just flowing into India, and India is, at the rate it is going, right, it can... There won't be anything left for Sri Lanka? No, we are very small, we are very small, so I, I think that we certainly can attract yeah. investment, but the question is, we have to make those changes and those reforms. If we don't, and we don't integrate with the rest of the world, yeah. we are in trouble. With the... Uh, it appears that way to us, um, it would, uh, and from what the people are talking about out there, it appears that the SJB is on its way to a victory at the different polls. In that context, what the, uh, it's also worth asking you what your other um, issues are. One of them, of course, is I'd like to ask you, uh, what's your take on the death penalty? Uh, uh. Yeah, the, the, the death penalty is always a controversial issue. Mm. In Sri Lanka, we have a law, and the law is basically a death penalty is given. Yes. That's the law. What has happened in practice in the late 1970s is the implementation law has been uh, really put on hold. Mm. If you look at it globally, and if you look at it even in figures that are there in 2021, mm. there were about n less than 500 people globally who were executed. Mm. That is in 18 countries. Death sentences have been passed in, mm. in about 20 countries. The statistics for China, North Korea and all are not available. What would the SJB want to do? With not, not available. You see, the statistics are not available. Yeah. So really the issue is, right, 
uh, if you have the death penalty, you are having the death penalty on the basis that it will reduce crime. Mm. Now that statistic is also questionable because certainly if you look like countries like Singapore, mm. it looks like it's worked positively, right? Mm. But if you look at in the US, different, different uh, states mm. have different laws on this and you can't conclusively argue that it has had a deterrent effect. And so what so would the SJB policy be? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm just coming to this mm. in trying to understand the issue at hand and yeah. what we are dealing with, yeah. right? So there is no clear evidence, mm. right, that it has, it, it doesn't... That it has a deterrent. A, it, it acts as a deterrent. Mm. Then the next question is, right, you have to make sure, right, that you don't have a miscarriage of justice. Yeah. Because if your uh, justice system is questionable or people have doubts about it, innocent people right, might actually be sentenced and innocent people may actually die. Mm. So these are some of the issues around it, if you look mm. at it. Now you asked me the question is, what will the SJB do about it? Yeah. Faraz, I think you got the question wrong. Mm. Because when it comes to things like the death penalty, I don't think that parties can have policies. Mm. I think when it comes to things about uh, something like life and death, mm. I think it's not a party decision because every individual can have a different opinion about it. But the party must have a take on it, surely? It's no. A, it's an important... No, no, no. I, I, I disagree with you completely and vehemently. So, so therefore, mm. it then brings me into my other question because your leader says it should be implemented. Is that his personal opinion or is that the opinion of the party? No, it, it, is, it is like this for us, right? It's not a case of the leader, what does the leader think or what does Iran think or what somebody else's think. Yeah. Different people across party lines will have different views about this, mm. right? Because this is a question about the right to life and right life and death. Yeah. And as I said, both sides could be argued. Both right. sides could be argued, right? So. This is a so you, question. So your party would be happy to leave it to individual choice, it to your conscience? It must be. A, 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 a vote on a death penalty yeah. or a vote on, let's say, even an abortion, hmm. right, should be a conscience vote. Hmm. Because the question there arises is, in, in, in the second case, is when does life actually start? Indeed. Right? So, so I think that if the death penalty is going to be practiced, I think there is no party line here people across parties will have different views mm. and therefore it, it, it needs to definitely be a vote on conscience right. that what do people actually think about the death penalty. So mm. different people will have different views about it. Yeah, you know, some will be convinced that it will be a good thing, it will reduce you know, uh, crime right? and they will be convinced about it and there will be others who will be skeptical about it because they believe in the right to life right? and also they will believe that it doesn't necessarily reduce it. Hmm. People certainly who commit crimes should be punished. There's no question about it. The question is, should they be punished with death penalty? Hmm. And if it is in a society where the justice system, people have questions about the justice system, there can be a miscarriage of justice as well. That is why I say that these are not issues just for parties. Indeed, these but it is, it is also an indication of the marvelous democracy that you are practic practicing at the SJB if uh, the policy is that it is going to be left to the conscience of each member. This was discussed even in, 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 in the United National Party some years ago, mm. right, and a uh, discussion there, and the conclusion was again, right, that uh, everyone needs to be consulted mm. because these are issues of life and death, and uh, different people could have different views about it, mm. and therefore, you know, you can't uh, have a party line mm. on a lot of this. We all certainly don't want uh, terrorism, we certainly don't want uh, the, you know, the proliferation of drugs mm. and that has to be dealt with. Different countries have dealt with it in different ways, some successfully and some unsuccessfully. Right. right? And so therefore, as I said, it's not a question about what is the party line. So if that debate needs to be reopened, yeah. uh, like it's being suggested, certainly the debate had, must be reopened. And the people in the country also have an opportunity. But for now, yeah. uh, a few okay. seconds away from finishing, but for now, uh, the focus will be on achieving uh, the people's mandate to let them vote. Uh, yes, of course. Now, uh, that is the most important thing, and the Supreme Court has really strengthened the hands of democracy and the sovereignty of the people, and that is what this JB stands for. Absolutely marvellous. Thank you very much, Eran Vikramaratna, for being on Newsline Live. Thank you. And answering all those questions.
Uh, it's now time for the prime time news. So we'll uh, take you straight there. But before I say, as I always do, God bless you all. <laughs>